September 2015, the United Nations Broadband Commission released a report which recommended censoring free speech on the internet to stop feminists from being criticized. The report was torn apart by critical parties in the media and was eventually taken offline completely. An official representative spoke to Vice Media and promised that the report would be updated soon with better citations. The Broadband Commission's upcoming update is not the only game in town. Another group at the United Nations, known as the Internet Governance Forum, is planning another report on this very same subject, and the final draft of the report is due to be released at their annual global IGF meeting in Brazil, November 10th through 13th, where they will have a 90-minute program that will take the form of a talk show. A show slated to be hosted by Jack Key, the manager of the women's rights program at the Association for Progressive Communications, an association which was also involved in the Broadband Commission's report. And yes, irrefutable proof of all this will be shown in what will follow. Not only do I know when their next meeting is and when their next report on how to shut down free speech on the internet to protect feminists is due, I have all of the group's planning information and all of their drafts of the report, including their most recent draft which was released on October 6th. That's right. I found and archived all of their emails in their email group, all of the recordings of their actual meetings, except for meeting number two, which they messed up the hyperlink on, and these meetings include both the audio and the interactive chat room that accompanies it, as well as all the drafts of the report and their official meeting summaries. These summaries also give us some clear and concise information, like why they chose to use the phrase online violence in place of the phrase online abuse. The summary for the first meeting states, the choice of language was also noted as important to framing, particularly with the use of words like abuse, victim, and survivor in relation to the issue. In one research project described during the discussion, many women did not recognize themselves as victims as they fail to see certain conduct online as abusive. While the term abuse is problematic because many communities still do not view certain online behavior as abusive and thus access to redress is limited. On the other hand, naming behavior as violence as opposed to abuse was also discussed, including the availability of remedies in response to violence, as well as broad conversations around the idea and scope of hate speech. Aha! So they choose to call it violence instead of abuse or survivors or victims because most women can't relate to those terms. I'm not exactly sure how calling words on a screen violence is supposed to help more people relate to the problem, but I digress. A question you might be asking is, how did I get all of this information? Did this get leaked to me? Or did I hack their server? No, all of this information is listed right on their official website, open to the public. Their emails from their official email list are especially interesting because it shows that a representative of Disney has been directly involved in writing the report as well. And the recordings of the meeting show that both the UK government and the Council of Europe have been soliciting case studies for the report. And then also people asked what happened to the case study that they had been sending in. For instance, the UK government had asked a few people, um, NGOs that they support to submit case studies, which they did, and they don't see that reflected in the document. The reason for that is that we are busy kind of alongside this document, I'm busy kind of trying to create a master document where where I'm incorporating the case studies where they're relevant. The aim is to publish publish a draft to next week Friday on the review platform on the IGF's website. So we'll have it in a proper format where it'll be more easy for people to comment and I think it'll hopefully be less confusing than the Google document. Um, and that will kind of be a proper first draft of the document and the aim as i said for that is next week friday um, and we'll obviously um notify everyone on the mailing list and ask people to contribute again um i don't think the case studies will all be incorporated by that stage because i'm still receiving a lot of them and we're still kind of prodding a lot of people who promised case studies to submit them and a point of interest that we we got great case studies from the council of europe um, two different departments there have submitted case studies, uh, which is great. Um, I got two for, I got one from Nepal and Brazil this week, which is also really interesting. But I had the ITU contact us this week and ask, because they have quite a big team working on CSERT, whether they can try and help. So that's a good development. Um, draft two will be published next Friday, hopefully. Um, and then the aim is to include the results from the social media campaign, which we'll discuss today, too, and also some of the later case studies in the draft after that. But perhaps the most intriguing finding from these meetings is that these people are not interested in science at all. 
They've already reached their conclusions from the onset and then seek to find case studies and surveys which can help prove their assumptions. For instance, in a meeting on September 18th, the leader of the meeting, Jack Key, was complaining that the most important section of the report, the impact section, is totally barren of supporting case studies and they really need to work on that. Um, the bit that is still quite, um, quite empty is the impact um, of online vow and impact on specific communities. And I think this is the one that, um, that, um, that we were hoping the Twitter chat will help us facilitate a conversation around. But it looks like neither Sadaf nor Subi are here at the moment. So I'm not sure how we're going to move forward on this. The meetings also show that they plan to include what they themselves deem as irrelevant case studies simply because they don't want to offend the people who submitted them. Go ahead, Andre. Yeah, it's actually thanks. It's good that you mentioned that because honestly, over the past week, I've been going through the case studies um, and actually finding, I'm being very honest, finding it quite difficult to imagine how we're going to incorporate all of them. Some of them, like, some of them are quite, it's quite clear how they fit into what we've been doing, but some of them really aren't that relevant. And, you know, of course, I'll try to incorporate them as far as possible. Um, but I do think we might have to just have a kind of bundle of case studies submitted just to also kind of uh, acknowledge the people who did the effort of, of submitting them. But, but yeah, that's, so that's mentioned. We, we, like, I've gotten about 12. But of those 12, I think only six are directly relevant to what they're doing. Um, and the, the survey analysis is very easy to incorporate into what we've, uh, what we've said, and it actually echoes a lot of, that's good. But the case studies, because we didn't give any prescriptions um, and guidelines, some of them really, yeah, and, um, as I mentioned, some of them are, are difficult to incorporate. But We've, for instance, in the examples section or the sections where we list the types of abuse, that was quite easy. I could incorporate some of the um, examples given from different countries. Um, and also measures, I could include some examples of, for instance, helplines in the UK. Um, but if we incorporate too much, it will make the document look very messy. If we incorporate too little, you're also not giving the people kind of credit for the effort. So I think the solution might be to have an appendix of the things that we haven't managed to incorporate because they just don't fit properly. Furthermore, their September 18th meeting reveals they plan to solicit the case studies that they desperately need to finish the report by holding a social media campaign on Twitter using the hashtag Take Back the Tech. Now, Take Back the Tech is actually not a new hashtag campaign. It's actually been used by the Association for Progressive Communications for quite some time. The Association for Progressive Communications, the APC, is an organization devoted to policy advocacy that protects women from criticism. And they've been running these activist campaigns to eliminate free speech online since 2006, according to their website. So not only do we have this email which shows that the APC has been directly involved in writing this report and possibly in control of it, but we have Jack's introduction at the very first meeting. Um, so I'm, I'm Jack, I'm with the, uh, I'm with the Association for Progressive Communication. I'm also one of the co-coordinators of this um, uh, BPF together with Susan. Um, yeah, just jumping in on that, I mean, as, as, as Jack knows as well, at this uh, last CSW, I think there was about five or six site events that dealt with um, different aspects of, of violence and online, which is really encouraging and great. So I think uh, there's a lot of interest there and definitely linking in that community and those experiences and interested parties would be would be good. And Jack, you were at all of those and know all of them and led some of those. Um, <coughs> and then as she also mentioned, um, the Broadband Commission Gender Working Group, uh, which APC is also on, is drafting a report due in September on um, online violence and we'll be collecting uh, case studies and so on for that. I'm not sure exactly what that looks like right now, but I can, I can find out more. At this point, I implore all viewers to help dig through the drafts, emails, and meetings and please let us know what you find. For further details on what exactly their 90-minute session at the IGF conference in Brazil on November 10th through 13th will entail, I'll just let this recording of Jack Key from their September 18th meeting 
fill you in. Yeah, and if you take back the text sort of、um, direct questions to specific people, you might get more. Oh, actually, no. This is just the hashtag, not the, not the, not the, not the account. But yeah, yeah. But of course, I will be tweeting from the, the account as well. So, but okay, cool. I think it seems like we all agree on that. Um, so we were thinking in terms of the session for the IGF is 90 minutes.、Um, the objective is really to share the findings of the of the BPS to share some of the key、uh, interesting points、um, to facilitate the conversation about the key issues that were raised, and then to identify potential areas for future research or policy interventions. Because the idea is that the BPS can either continue next year but have a different focus and emphasis. Or we might want to change the topic or see where the gaps are. So that's that's really 90 minutes for us to talk about the issues that were raised, bring out different perspectives, share the findings with different people. So thinking through like、um, what is the best format.、Um, so we thought it would be nice to have it like a bit of a, a dialogue or a conversation, like a talk show.、Um, and I volunteered to host it <laughs> so that I don't have to talk about content.、Um, and then、uh, Anri can come and share with us about the methodology and the process in which, because you know, obviously Anri is putting so much work into this as well, and is the best person to actually、um, frame how we how we got how we went about and got this、um, got this document、uh, out, and not just the document, but kind of like the process of engagement and conversation. Um, and then to get、uh, so the first section would be looking at the issue, the impact, and why it happens.、Um, and we thought that maybe、um, someone from、uh, APC could be helpful in this, considering the the amount of research work that's been done.、Um, so tentative suggestion was、um, was Jan.、Um, and then the next is to look at specific communities. Um, in terms of how it impacts on specific communities, and this could be、um, a couple of communities you were thinking of,、um, and the idea was maybe Bianca or Sadaf, like you know, looking at the at the six six level,、um, and then asking the question about what are some of the responses. So what has some of the responses been in terms of、um, dealing with this issue、uh, from the private sector? From the government, as well as from community and CSO level, as well as technical community. So it'll be good if we can get four different people from different stakeholder groups to actually speak to this.、Um, so for private sector, we were thinking possibly Twitter because they've been doing so much response.、Uh, they've been really trying to step up their response in relation to dealing with this issue.、Um, with government, we were thinking that it would be good to have from、uh, both developed and developing countries to have a diversity of perspectives. Um, and then I think、um, we approached Estonia, right?、Um, and we were wondering about maybe Philippines、um, and also possibly UK.、Um, and there was also some con- conversation about OECD. So、um, there's a few possibilities. And then community and CSO level, it'd be good if we can get someone actually from Brazil to talk about some of the interventions there. It might be a good idea. Um, in technical community, we really haven't、um, come to much agreement around this, but、um, maybe maybe you will have some suggestions. And then we might want, and then to kind of、um, think about some policy concerns, so issues that might,、uh, you know, what 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 are some of the policy implications of this issue?、Um, and this would be from the section of、uh, potential contentions, contradictions, and conflicts and tensions. So for for example,、um, uh, not said no no.、Um, I meant uh, I meant uh, I was saying that for Brazil, it'll be good if we can get a community or CSO response. So so how has、uh, so looking at community initiatives? But of course, if if the Brazilians、uh, might be a good idea actually looking at SaferNet and how they've dealt with things. Um, it could be interesting because it's quite a comprehensive system, and it's one of the earliest and still sustaining systems around in terms of responding to children. But I think they're broader than that as well. Okay.、Um, yes, it is controversial, but let's see. <laughs> Maybe we can ask audience to ask questions.、Um, so moving on, and so some of, so to to raise some of these policy issues and concerns. One is to look at. Um, the tensions between addressing this 
uh, with freedom of expression issues and hate speech. And we thought that it would be great if Rebecca McKinnon can actually speak to this. It could be um, interesting. Uh, and then, uh, and then around possibly around privacy, anonymity, and consent. And the question is. Maybe we could invite a new privacy special rapporteur on this, or potentially um, David Kay, who is a special rapporteur on freedom of expression, because of his recent report. And he was also, you know, he's very clued in also around like a, uh, gender and sexuality issues in relation to privacy and anonymity and encryption and safety. So it might be quite interesting to get his input. Um, and then we thought about um, the concerns around cross jurisdictional issues. Um, and the Internet and Jurisdiction Project might be a really interesting, um, uh, might be able to give a really interesting input into this. Um, and then to legislate or not to legislate, that is the question. Um, not quite sure who to get for this. And then maybe an international government, uh, an intergovernmental organization, so someone from ITU or UN Women. Um, and we've already um, reached out to check, so. So, yep, that's kind of where we're at so far.